Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the football Grump, and with me as always is Mike, the Cranky Fan. Grump, I am nice and recharged after the bye week. Ran down to College Station and see my Gators beat A&M. That was fun. Uh, Now I'm back here. We're recharged after the week off and ready to talk State of the Giants, as we do not have meaningless football in the beginning of November, we have very meaningful football for once in our lives. Yeah, for the first time in the history of this podcast, I think, right? We I are, believe so. We are relevant in November? Well, we were relevant two years ago. I mean, like, legitimately relevant. We, were, Yeah, we weren't just uh, the, the victim of a horrible division. No, if anything, now we're 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 relevant. We're the victim in, of a good division. Yeah, in spite of a good division. Right. Um, and uh, for those of you who are new to this podcast, um, we are available everywhere: iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, Google Play, anywhere where you can listen to podcasts, you'll find this show. But of course, also on YouTube. Um, we've been around for quite some time now. What has it been like? Four. It's, our first season was 2017, right? Uh, it was the year after the playoff run, after the boat trip. Yeah, so that'd be 2017. <laughs> um, and this is actually the first time that uh, we have a real shot at relevancy in late December. I should All say, I know right? is I'm just excited for, you know, not only going to the game, you know, in uh, this weekend, but you know, in, in two week in December, going to real division games in December, which mean things for getting to the playoffs. It's, it's, it's real shitty to to have season tickets and go to games that mean absolutely nothing that are also like twenty two degrees outside. Yeah, <laughs> it would have been nice if the Maras and the Hesses would, or whoever the hell owns the the Johnsons, would have got together and put a roof on that stadium and maybe at least have some comfort in December when we're watching crappy football, but. Well, now we have two good football teams that play in the same stadium, you know, and let the crappy weather be damned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, is that what we're heading for on Sunday? Doesn't matter. We will have all that information on the preview pod that's on uh, Friday. We're previewing our next game against the Houston Texans. But with the bye week, what we, I mean, what we've done in the past with this show, with the bye week, is kind of just taken a step back and been like, man, what happened? Because cause that's kind of been the story of every single year. Even though with some years we kind of knew things weren't going to be great. Um, we calculated how many days until the draft. We yeah. were looking at free agents available. All the, you know, do we fire the coach? What, do we fire the GM? All those things. Yeah. And, and this year we're not going to do that. But, you know, just the fact that they're winning does not mean anything. I mean, this is a team that fired its coach somewhat surprisingly and i say somewhat surprisingly because i think people in the building weren't expecting that uh certain people in the building were not expecting joe judge to be fired i mean he was not fired during the season it was after all the games had been played the general manager was let to retire i mean this is a full 100 percent calculated mm-hmm. rebuild they just happen to be winning right now with- at this point at this point last year you know the 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 second Monday in November last year, we did not think Joe Judge was getting fired. It, things just snowballed so far out of control so fast from a bad situation to far, far worse. But this time last year, we were, you know, we assumed he'd be the coach going forward. Yeah, and I wasn't even 100% sure that at the end of the year he was going to be gone. It felt like it was definite possibility, but it was close to like a 60-40. And mm. part of that was, you know— it just felt that when Joe Judge was hired, he was given a leash with an understanding of the situation that he was hired into and what he hoped to build and accomplish here was something that you wouldn't expect to be built in two years. And then in that second year, when everybody got hurt right at the beginning of the season and pretty much tanked the season, it almost felt like you'd – not that you had to give him a pass, but that the Maras would. Yeah, um, I think also if Gettleman would have been around another year or two, Judge probably would stay another year as well. I mean, I it was know. kind of predetermined that Gettleman was going to be retiring at the end of this year, and everything just kind of ex- exacerbated that and made it more obvious. So that was the right time to, if you wanted to start clean house and start completely over, you know, you know the 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 rambling press conference didn't help his cause. The uh, The kneeling didn't help his cause, all of those things. But I think it was kind of a perfect storm of why he was gone right then. 
But I think also those things were indications that he was safe, not or that he at least felt safe, not that he was on the chopping block. I mean, I don't think you kneel if you know you're gone. I mean, at that point, you might oh, as no, well I meant, go bombs I meant away. The reaction, the reaction to oh, it. Oh, sure. Not, no, I understand. Yeah. I'm just saying all that stuff was was strange because, oh yeah, it, it, like you said, these are these are indications that someone is just these are fireable offenses. I mean, really, for you know, on top of a bad season, you know, doing quarterback sneaks on third and long, second and long, yeah, uh, having a 12 minute response to a reporter that kind of asked a question, and you're just kind of talking about how that organization is not a clown show. These are things, but. Also, I don't think a guy who ha- who is like I got nothing to lose. I don't think a guy like that does any of this stuff. I mean, like oh, I agree. when when Ben McAdoo didn't really even have an answer at the podium for what went wrong. Like I want to say maybe a day before he got fired, he just kind of was like, um, well, and he didn't really answer. That to me was a dead man. Joe Judge rambling was a guy almost giving the world an inside look at the same conversation he's had with his bosses. So everything that was a fireable offense also felt like it was handled in a way that he felt safe. So yeah. nothing made sense to me at the end of the year. Just the the point was it wasn't a foregone conclusion that he was done when he got right. fired. Um, so which brings us back to this episode and what we're going to do with the bye week. Um, mm-hmm. Really, truly... I think it's important that while this team is very relevant in this season, and we're going to talk about this season, much of the focus is going to be about towing that line, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's only so much you can do about thinking about the future in the middle of a season. You know, there's no draft that goes on during week nine. You know, the trade deadline is passed, so you can't, you know, acquire anybody to make a final push. You know, the waiver wire is pretty barren as it is. So, you know, from this point forward, it's all about what can you do for this year with the talent you have now and the schedule in front of you. I mean, we'll, you know, we'll certainly think about, you know, the offseason and how to continue this rebuild. And this is still a rebuild. You know, let's not get into any false delusions that this team, you know, skipped the process and went from a team that needed a complete overhaul to Super Bowl contender because they won – a bunch of games in September and October. Um, but one of the themes we've been talking about in the show all year is that the, the hard times of starting a rebuild are a lot easier to swallow when you're winning and you're getting buy-in. You're getting buy-in from the media, the fans, the people in the building, everybody. So, you know, this is the best case scenario of what, you know, if we go back and think about this team in the off season and not just me and grump, you know, not all of you guys who follow us on Twitter, but you know, the media, the local media, the national media thought this team was going to suck and be really, really bad. You know, three wins, four wins, you know, have potential of taking the quarterback of their, their choice in the draft, you know, as being a potential top five pick next year. So we are overachieving, you know, getting relevant very quickly and building that foundation so when we have more talent come in, this team is going to be ready to start really cooking with gas. And before we get to all the gas portion of this podcast, <laughs> we have to stop doing what we're doing right now and talk about actual news, current day, current events. This morning, which by the time you guys are hearing this, is yesterday morning, so it's a little bit of old news for you. Uh, Xavier McKinney, this is all interesting, right? So Xavier mm-hmm. McKinney posted on Twitter uh, basically a message saying that on his bye week he went to Mexico he was on an ATV doesn't really specify how but got into an accident hurt his hand and will be out for several weeks now this is interesting on multiple levels because a the player announced it not the coach Mm -hmm. Um, Dable has been very tight-lipped with timelines on injuries Very, yep. and th- that's significant because it plays into the Kadarius Tony trade. Um, and yet, here we have a player just going ahead and spreading the news. I, I wonder if that was, I wonder if that was punishment. What do you think? Do you think the coach was like, you know what, this is your mistake, your fault, you're going to tell the fans what happened here? Because they also just, just hear me out, they placed him on the NFI list, which is not IR. In fact, it allows the Giants to not pay him. 
specifically because his injury violates his contract Mm -hmm. or whatever they sign for uh, off the field activities. I don't know if that's like an every player thing or just specifically his, but ATVs are specifically mentioned as an off the field activity that if gotten hurt, they may have their pay withheld or something like that. Um, so I, do you think it was a punishment? Because it's very unorthodox for the Dable regime for a player to be giving a timeline, giving their injury. What do you think? See, I'm actually looking at it the opposite because to me, players in the modern, you know, not only just NFL, but in sports, you know, entertainers, actors, musicians, they love to control the narrative of everything, right? If they could, they'd bypass the media for everything and just, you know, get on their social platforms and tell you directly what's going on, curated in a way that they want to say it. To me, the punishment would be, I'm telling you everybody what happened and you no longer have the narrative on it. So I don't know if that was, maybe, you know, Dable's not an old school guy. You know, he's not Tom Coughlin. He's not some old, you know, some boomer who's just going to be like, I'm handling this the old way. Um, So I don't know if it was a punishment necessarily. I think it's just one of his, you're taking responsibility you have to deal with this. This is not something we're going to, you know. Right. I, I think of it as um, kind of like that thing when you're like a little kid and you say something shitty to like a complete stranger. And go your up mom, there and say you're sorry. Yeah, your mom tells you, you have to go say you're sorry. Uh, yeah. Obviously, right? That's how you mm-hmm. teach a lesson. But I don't know. I, that's kind of where my head goes. I'm not really sure. Regardless, the point is one of the few very good players that this team has that is young and is able to build around is now not able to play in the second half of the season. This is supposed to be the week where people are getting healthy. Yeah, I mean, let's let's break this down for a second too and put this a little bit into perspective because there's a couple of narratives that are going on all instantly and we knew they were going to happen. One is, you know, another guy who just, you know, isn't focused in the off seat on the off week and is just doing things recklessly and you know, let me tell you guys a little secret. When these guys have a bye week, the last thing they're thinking about is football. They're not sitting home, you know, looking at film, looking at the playbook, you know, working out, doing that stuff. They're getting away. And they're going to go, like, where was he? In Aruba? Or he was somewhere like that, right? Cabo? Cabo. I mean, these guys are on the first jet out, and they're doing stuff like that. And, you know, I think what he said in his post was it was a guided tour ATV. So it wasn't like he was going off the side of a mountain doing it. But... It is a dangerous activity. I, I think you mentioned it specifically written in the contract. It's something where you have to wear a helmet. You have to sign an insurance waiver. You going with a guide. You add all those things up. I mean, your chances of injury are slim, but because you have to take all those precautions, the potential for injury is there. So I don't think it's just someone being reckless. I just think, you know, maybe the, you know, it's it's not as egregious as doing something really crazy like skydiving or, or something like drag racing, going 180 miles an hour down the highway because they're bored, going to Vegas to L.A. in an hour or something. But the one thing it also isn't is the equation of the boat trip, the infamous boat trip, where people – the other thing where people are jumping right to – up. Oh, it's the same old giants, you know, they're on boat trips and they're not caring about, you know, what the job is at hand and, and the focus. Bye weeks are there for a reason, guys. They are to take a break. And you want to go into your little spiel about the boat? The, I mean, the- so there's there's two things at hand here. One, Xavier McKinney is 23-year-old doing a guided ATV tour is exactly the kind of thing that my mom would think would be a fun idea in Mexico. So this right. is not him. Like you said, this is not him skydiving. I think people see ATV and they immediately think like, um, going over giant dirt hills and getting airborne and stuff like that. I know Jihad Ward posted a picture of him on Instagram doing a wheelie, whatever. I don't know if he got hurt doing something stupid. That maybe, reckless. maybe yeah. he, I'm not ruling it out, but I'm also not going to just slam the dude, uh, for enjoying his vacation, which by the way, all of us take a vacation from our jobs, mm-hmm. we all do stupid shit like it's this. It's a grind. Football is a grind, yeah, ladies man. and gentlemen. It's a, you know, but almost I, a year-round grind mentally and physically. I also don't want to act like I'm not pissed. I mean, this dude is a professional. He had to know the risks. Um, 
you know, no matter what happened, whether he was clowning around or not, uh, this does fall on him. And it sucks. It sucks for everyone involved, including himself, because now he's not getting paid. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a huge detriment. As far as the boat trip goes, look, Giants fans need to get over the boat trip, man. The boat trip is one of those things where you look at a picture of guys having fun instead of working for a big game, which, by the way, this is already not different or not the same because they're not getting prepared. They're playing the Texans this week. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't a bye week before the well, playoffs. No, it's, like, a, it's a regular season game week eight as opposed to a playoff But that's a, exactly it's my the Texans point. or who it is. Well, my point is, is that this isn't like the perception is that they were not preparing for a big game and were instead right. enjoying a boat. The other thing is that it's just perception. We don't know what they were talking about on the boat or what they did before and after they got on the boat. We don't know if they were working on anything. And I also don't care because this isn't a perception thing at all with Xavier McKinney. This is right. a legitimate injury that does, quite frankly, X plus Y equals Z. This affects the team this year immediately. There's no maybe he dropped the pass because he's, his mind is still in the water or it's too cold and he was just vacationing. Any of this stupid hocus pocus trip. bullshit that yeah. people attach to a photo it is, is just so fucking dumb. The and- boat trip was just a product of a, com- a perfect storm of it was Odell Beckham. It was a picture that appeared like a bunch of guys just in relaxed mode. You know, South Beach, whatever it was, Miami, down in Florida. It's just all those things is a perfect storm of the timing. And if it wasn't Odell Beckham, no one would care. I mean, the the uh, you know the snowball again going downhill with Beckham. All these things that put himself into a position where he's going to be ridiculed for that just added to it. So I think if it was just you know if it was randomly a bunch of giant you know cornerbacks, no one cares. The fact that it was Beckham on top of all the other shit he did, for some reason you people still want on this team. I'll never know, but... <sighs> I don't get it. But, like, also, so the, the boat trip was in 2016 when they were playing really well. They went to the playoffs. You know, we actually started this podcast in 2017 because we were privately discussing how we didn't understand how fans thought this... We, we were like, this team is winning, but they're not that good. Um, and that's kind of how this podcast got started. But, you know, just refresh some fans' memories. 2015, the Giants were playing poorly. That was the year that Jason Pierre-Paul blew up his hand in the offseason. He had just come back, was playing with a club on his arm, mm-hmm. and they hosted the Carolina Panthers in December. Now, they actually only missed the playoffs by about a game that year, maybe mm-hmm. two games, despite the fact that they were not playing well and whatever. That was the Josh Norman game, right? That was the Josh Norman game, which, if you'll remember, Odell Beckham dropped a like first play of the game yeah. he was behind the entire defense and just fucking dropped it i don't think he was on a fucking boat before that maybe it's possible that maybe guys just, just drop <laughs> passes dude and you know what maybe if they won that game they go to the playoffs next year but i don't hear anybody complaining about that because there's no fucking photo before and everybody needs to grow up it's a picture it's a picture and you you you're the ones who let it haunt you the media puts all sorts of dumb shit out in the internet you have the choice to ignore it the giants are winning they just were that's like four coaches ago i don't care I don't yeah. care. I don't even. I, I was in a different relationship when that happened. I mean, like, <laughs> we we're going back so far. So it's it just. You had hair back then. I had hair kids. back then. Yeah. I don't know. Um, no, my I point is, I, I, I don't give a fuck about the boat trip. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a bad injury to a very good player. We don't really know any of the details, and we never know any details about injuries. And let's not speculate. Yeah. I mean, now, let's not get into the whole. Oh, this is a bad guy now. Oh, they should cut him. Oh, they shouldn't, you know. He's going to he's going to pay his price for it by not being on the field. He's not going to get paid while he's out. That's it. Let's not all of a sudden make the leap of stereotyping him as a bad guy or another in the line of giants who blah 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 blah. It's just unfortunate, you know. Get him back on the field as soon as possible and let's just move on with our lives. Yeah. And and for the record, you guys um you guys are just upset that a guy dropped passes. Has nothing to do with the picture. That's it. Anyway, moving from that onto the larger image of the entire franchise. So we have several kind of different topics that we kind of want to go over. Um, how do you want to start? What do you want? You want to just start well, going down the line? Yeah. Well, what I did was Grump actually did some uh, show prep this week. So. I was thinking about it on the flight home yesterday, just kind of, you know, 
first of all, I've always wanted to interview you, Grump. <laughs> I was thinking about it as like, I like to ask you some questions about this season. And we kind of have like a, a free flowing conversation usually about what's going on. But I wanted to get your thoughts because, um, again, for a lot of you who are new to the show, we don't really do that much prep together. And we, you know, obviously Grump does all his um, his film work and his studies. I take my notes. I, I have all my thoughts in order. But we don't really talk about it before the show actually happens. So that's why it, it kind of seems a little more natural what we're talking about on this show. But I, right. I, so, I like to think that we we actually run a podcast, not a show. I think like yeah. YouTube kind of makes it feel more like a show. But honestly, these are just us talking. Yeah. But I was really thinking about, you know, as we kind of like at this, you know, halfway point. I don't know if it's technically halfway or not, but definitely we're done with the first half of the year. What have we accomplished? What have we what's been surprises, good and bad, and then what do we need to do the rest of the year, and what does this mean going forward? So I came up with some questions. I figured I'd throw them at you, give me your thoughts, and I'll kind of go back and forth, and we can kind of run through some some of these. I think uh, that might be the best way to go. I am so. I am ready. I'm ready. All Just right. To me. Shoot him. Question one. Has the first half – the start of this first half change what the front office should do with its rebuild plan as well as its timeline. So in other words, you know, if we would have been three and seven at this point, which most people probably expected, there's probably a plan in place for year one, year two, year three. Now, all of a sudden that, you know, we've come to this big start. Do you think that the front office should or will deviate from their original plan and what should they do? I don't know if they will. But I think they should, and here's why. I mean, you may be assuming that I'm saying this because they're winning uh, and they should stay the course or something like that, and that's not really what I mean. What I mean is this is a first-time head coach and a first-time GM and a first-time assistant GM that they got from Philadelphia, I believe. Um, this is a first-time offensive coordinator. This is, a, this is a new staff. These are young guys, and whatever plan they had – I guarantee you some things went a little wrong and some things went a little bit better than they thought. So they should alter everything because they are not super experienced with this and they should be adjusting on the fly because they're not, they don't have this wealth of wisdom that comes with years of being, trust me, I've seen this before. It's fools. Go, you know what I mean? They don't right. have that. They should be adjusting a little bit, but should they be altering course to be a, a, a win sooner team? Absolutely not. But yeah. whatever, whatever whatever assumptions that they had, I guarantee you that some things went differently. That was some was better and some was worse. And they should adjust accordingly because they should be learning. It's only their first year doing this shit. Yeah, I agree. The, 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 the question was originally in my mind was about, you know, okay, after this season is over, based on the success of what they've done, you know, are they going to try to take any shortcuts or try to, you know, think differently about their long-term vision for the rebuild? Um I agree with you. I mean, I think now, you know, going to the season, most sane, logical Giant fans figured we would be in the market for a new quarterback. Um, most likely would be in the market for a new running back as well. And I think now this front office has options. I'm not saying at this moment, well, we definitely keep Daniel Jones. I'm not saying at this moment we definitely keep Saquon Barkley. But I think this front office now has – some decisions to make, which, and options when you don't have it before, and having more options is good. So I, I, you know, as happy as I am for this team so far and the success and excited for the wins, you know, you know, there you can tell there are still a lot of glaring holes. You know, Grump and I had this discussion during the week: what defines a contender, a Super Bowl contender? And Grump's definition was that we could beat anybody to win a Super Bowl. And my definition was when you're going into the playoffs, you should feel like you should beat everybody yet. And I think we're right now, we're at the, we could beat somebody if we get in, but I want to get to that where we should, we should be able to beat teams. And we have a long way to go before we get there. Well, of course, you're striving for that. I mean, like, of course, right. But, but I mean, for me, yeah, I, I think in a, a single elimination playoff, any team that could win is a contender. But, we are essentially splitting 
yeah. players here. I yeah, mean, yeah. like whether they are contenders or not by some technical definition does not change the fact that there are holes that need to be addressed regardless, right? Absolutely. I mean, we – offensive line, you know, we decisions still have to be made about quarterback and running back, uh, linebackers. You know, there's all sorts of things in depth on this team overall. Those aren't quick fixes, and we've tried the quick fix route in the past, and it's backfired us, and it's, you know, hurt us for a couple of years after the fact. And we have a wide receiver that we can't do anything with right now. Exactly, and wide receiver is another major thing. So, I think we got a little glimpse into their soul when they did not make any moves for a wide receiver at the, uh, at the trade deadline. I mean, I think in the past regimes, past teams in this city you know just because it's new york feeling that the new york fan isn't patient we have to do something i think would have done something i think staying pat said a lot about that they have a plan and they're sticking to the plan and they're not going to overpay for something for a quick fix whether it's for 2022 or even next year maybe all right next question for you what has been the biggest surprise for you this season to date? I would say the way the defense played right out of the gate. Um, mm -hmm. We were seriously concerned. Um, I, I mean, just going off of the roster, we, you know, we did a whole episode exercise where I wasted all this fucking time doing math and trying <laughs> to figure out how we were going to fit all these guys on, on under the cap and how we we're going to keep James Bradbury. And, oh, my God, what are we going to do without James Bradbury? And we can't lose this guy. We can't lose that guy. We won't even be remotely competitive. What are we going to do? Um, and there were some serious holes. I mean, and then to, to completely throw the door in our face right before the season starts, Blake Martinez is cut. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, to start the season, Tibbs is hurt. Z's is hurt. Everybody's hurt. We don't have a CB2. Um, and you look at what the Titans have done since they played us. We are the outlier. The outlier in the Titans season in stopping Derrick Henry. I mean, this defense has shown up week after week with different game plans, different ways to completely neutralize offenses. Um, and they've done it with what we've considered to be a weakened roster. And then as injuries piled up, I mean, Fabian Moreau. Mm -hmm. Fabian Moreau was signed off the street. If they really thought that Fabian Moreau was going to be, you know, a, a, a legitimate starter uh, that was going to be playing really well in this defense, they would have just signed him at the beginning of the year. Um, I, I don't know. To me, I was, I, I know you, you had your own Todd Grantham like, horror Fears. stories and nightmares sure. about what this defense was going to be. And I don't, I mean, you, you tell me, has it lived up to that? The fears? Absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, third and Grantham is not on this team where right. you just, you bring the house every play and you leave these guys exposed and it's third and 16, they get 18. Yeah. And for the most part, we have not seen that this year. No, we've had some, I mean, and even when we've had like individual players kind of like carve us up or whatever, hasn't resulted in losses really but that happens yeah i sure. mean that's, that's because a lot of those things happened uh as a result of stopping their main engine to their offense mm -hmm. you know that's the sacrifice you're willing to make you know i don't care if justin fields runs for 80 yards because he's not going to win this game for us or whatever you know i, I maybe that was the exact opposite of what i wanted to say but um no you're right uh I, to me that was the biggest surprise everything else i could have seen because you know if, if you want to say Saquon or DJ, you know, Saquon's two years removed from injury. He looks a lot like the Saquon that we saw in 2018. That's not super surprising. We're going to get into those two in a yeah, minute. Yeah, of sure. course. But I'm just yeah. saying, like, the other obvious ones, like Daniel Jones playing well. I mean, like, we've always said that if he were in the right system or had an offensive coach or, or something, you know, here they have a very creative offensive coach. It's no surprise to me that he's been pretty good. Uh, what is surprising is how well Wink Martindale got that defense to play right away. Yeah, I'm going to say three things have been the biggest surprise. One, obviously, the record. I mean, the bottom line is never in my wildest fantasies would this team be, you know, six and two. That, so that's, that's an obvious one, but it's still worth repeating and saying. That is a, a, a shocker of shocker. Uh, but specifically, the two things are, one, how well this team has played in the second halves and late in games and has closed out games. 
I just thought with this roster, with the limited talent and even more limited depth, and that depth being, you know, challenged even more that when you have injuries, I thought this would be a team that faded and folded in fourth quarters. They have not done that. So that's been a massive surprise. Um, the second thing is, and we're going to talk about Daniel Jones in a minute, but the fact that Daniel Jones, with having such limited weapons around him, having basically no wide receivers, looks a lot more comfortable in this offense and a lot more comfortable as a quarterback. I mean, this could have been, you know, it could have been very easy for this offense to be terrible, Daniel Jones to be awful, using that as an excuse. But the fact that we really have one one sort of reliable receiver who I was banging on the drum to get rid of for the last couple of years, and Darius Slayton, um, that's a shock to me. Yeah, I guess I'm not that surprised about Darius Slayton because – um, I don't think he's playing exceptionally well. He's just been the only reliable one. And when you, if you were to yeah. give me the list of names, that to me it doesn't. This wasn't me. a Darian Slayton uh, thing, but you're right. Um, yeah. I just thought without having anybody reliable really to to go on, is having basically no weapons at all. That the the narrative, at least around Daniel Jones, is he's not so bad right now, sure. and that's very shocking. Um, so I guess let's let's talk about Daniel Jones then specifically. Um, what has impressed you the most about him this year? And, you know, something that may not have been happening in the past, but it's happening this year. Impressed me the most. I would say it appears to me in recent weeks that he's claimed this offense, this team. Um, I guess in the past, we kind of saw him run Pat Shermer's offense with uh, effectiveness, you know, even immediately in that Tampa Bay game, his first start. Um but he still kind of looked like a deer in the headlights. Like he still looked like a kid in Pat Shermer's off, and he was. Um, and then you know, he gets he gets stuck in Joe Judge's, Jason Garrett's iron shackles of an offense where they're not going to let him throw deep or or make too many decisions. Uh, you know, they're kind of lean on running the ball, and and they're going to build an offensive line that's going to push guys and all this stuff. It, I mean. Maybe it's just my perception, but it never really looked like Jones was comfortable in that offense either. I mean, whether you want to blame Joe Judge, Dave Gettleman, Jason Garrett, or Daniel Jones, I don't really care. It just didn't seem like it was working for Jones. This offense, I, well, I mean, just one second. In half a season only, not only has he won games or completed four or five fourth quarter comebacks, whatever it is, we've seen him literally take command of this team. Like a man. I mean, we've always known that he was tough as hell with injuries and whatever. But, like, really, you know, yelling at his team, getting them up on the line of scrimmage, getting everything all set up. We, we kind of saw a little bit of that last year in the very beginnings of the year. But, I mean, you throw in all the injuries to him and whatever that happened last year. It was just – last year was just such a wash. This is the the year it finally looks like this is – Jones's offense. It's his team. It doesn't even really look necessarily like it's Dable's or Kafka's offense. This is like this is the Giants' offense. This is all of their minds, and it starts right away yeah. with the way Dable approached Daniel Jones and asked him, "What plays do you like playing?" Well, so you could tell when it's a rookie quarterback or a backup or a guy who's new to a team where it feels like they're on training wheels and. You know, they're, like, they're feeding him what to do, and you just go do it. Where now it's no longer with Daniel Jones that I'm being, I'm on training wheels. It's run the offense, kid. You know, make decisions, kid. I, I mean, I could be wrong. It just certainly feels that it's the first time I've felt that way about Daniel Jones is that this is his team, this is his offense, and he's mm -hmm. running it. And it may just be because they're winning. I mean, I, I could just be. You know, looking through rose-colored glasses, but that's yeah, kind know, of been. The, but we're, we're but doing, everything but... else, the traits have always been there for DJ. He's always been able to run. He's always been able to fake handoffs. He's always been able to control an offense in terms of getting everybody lined up. He's always been able to read a defense. He's always been able to throw and throw on the move. These things were never really too difficult for him. These were things we knew about him. It's why he was drafted. Yeah, but think about this: like what he know, hasn't done is win. They're winning, but like you know, if Tennessee hits the field goal. Or, you know, the last second things happen and this record goes from, you know, two losses to four losses. I don't know if the, the perception of how Daniel Jones is playing really changes that much. So I'm I'm just I'm very pleased that they're at least making 
it dip more difficult than to say, well, we're done with him. And I and I had said this in the off season that I had a theory they already had made their decision they were done with him. And it was part of a little conspiracy cranky theory that this is part of a I'm tanking without saying I'm tanking move of playing him. And that's all moot now because he's a legitimate quarterback and they have some decisions to make about him. Uh, what do you think that he still he needs to work on still going forward? I mean, if not even for this year, and if, let, let's assume they bring him back next year for on a short-term basis or immediate, what, what's the biggest thing he has to do to work on to improve? I would say his pocket movement. Um, it's something that he's slowly improved on throughout his time in the NFL, slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure it's something that's very difficult as there's a constant coaching carousel with new offenses, new quarterback coaches, new head coaches, new offensive coordinators. I mean, all this stuff. I, I think makes fine tuning things like moving around in the pocket pretty difficult. But it's certainly it's the cause of his fumbles, man. It's not feeling pressure and getting away from it. And it is something that he has gotten better at, but still slowly. Um when it happens in spurts, I'll I'll do the Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the T V meme. Every time he, he like he moves <laughs> up in the pocket and slides out and finds an escape route, but he stays behind the line of scrimmage, he's still looking downfield. Every time he does that shit, I'm like, that's a man. That's that's how you play quarterback. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something he has to continue doing. Um, it's certainly appeared easier as the offensive line has not allowed three guys coming at him, but the occasional one guy breaking free <laughs> certainly makes moving in the pocket a lot easier because there's one to move in. Um, so not all of that is necessarily his fault either, but, um, yeah, he could stand to keep working on that. I mean, like the things that make Jalen Hurts. Uh, put up huge numbers is that's the thing that he's really good at is being on the move um, improvising Daniel Jones is not great at improvising throwing the ball no we haven't really seen any of that and I don't know that he ever will but the least he could do to get better is to uh, get out of the pocket and move around in the pocket in a way manipulate the pocket to uh, let things happen downfield so he doesn't have to automatically be running or let the play completely break or any of that stuff Jones or Barkley, um, if you only have the money for one that you want to lock up long term, because you know they both require a pretty penny to keep, who would you lean towards right now keeping? It's so hard. It's so hard because there's so many things to consider. Mm-hmm. Um, there is very few people that's ever played the game that are like Saquon Barkley, and I don't think that that's an incendiary statement, right? Like that is. That's just a fact, right? There's not that many guys who are like him that ever played. He gets comparisons to guys like Barry Sanders, and not many receive running backs in the last 15 years have. Very few. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that any offense can benefit from a Saquon Barkley. The same can't be said for Daniel Jones, but that position is also far more important. And it's even harder to find competent guys at that. You can find competent running backs. It's not easy to find competent quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. <sighs> well, let me ask you this then, a kind of related question. Our running game, the strength of our running game, is it more because we have an elite running back in Barkley or just the way this offensive line and the play action you know, of, of Daniel Jones and just – the, the play calling, the scheme, you know, all of that. I mean, how much do you think is, well, we just have this elite running back that just trumps all that, or I don't really need that elite running back for this running game to be successful? I don't know. I don't think that they'll play well if Bart – well, I'm just trying to say, like, if, if one or the other is hurt, what are our chances of winning the game? And I think it doesn't matter. Either one and the game's over, Right. Oh, yeah. I'm just trying to think about my, you know, as I'm moving forward with this, you know, if I'm I'm very I know how what a dynamic guy Barkley is. and I know that he's a unique skill set. I know how good he is. I know how popular he is. I know face of the franchise and all that other stuff. But I I I I. I I really like to parse out like how much of it really is him and how much is everything else. Cause if it's a lot of it's everything else to your point, I'd rather just plug a plug and play with somebody else and just keep the quarterback. 
Okay, and if, I, if I'm I had in love to... with Daniel Jones, but well, here's what I'll say: as far as Saquon's impact on the running game, um, I think that what makes Barkley special has scored us the seven points in games when we most needed it, mm-hmm. but otherwise, for the most part, a fast running back could have given what he gave us. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. A good quality running back, a second round pick of some kind. I don't know. Whatever. You get my point. Right. Guys you can find give you 90% of Saquon. And this year, when we needed touchdowns, he gave us the extra seven with his ability to shuck a tackle behind the line of scrimmage and then reverse field. I don't even remember. Was that the Bears game? I don't even remember. It was the Bears game. Um, you know, things like that have given us the seven points we needed to win this year. But – what is this year? This year is a bonus. This mm-hmm. isn't this isn't the ideal roster that you trot out to the Super Bowl. So it's is it is it even relevant what that last ten percent is, you know? Mm-hmm. Let's talk about let's talk about coaching staff and front office for a little bit. Um Dave, what's impressed you the most about him this year? His shoe game? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know if it's necessarily impressive. I, I mean, I mean, Dable's coaches this team to win, so I mean that's impressive in itself. He's gathered a staff of what appears to be very intelligent people to surround him. Uh, but I think it's at least refreshing, if not impressive, that he's very lockstep with his GM. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that counts as impressive, but it's certainly the most refreshing thing to me. Going back as far back as I can think of me having an in-depth opinion on all things Giants, it never felt like – I mean, you go back to those – even the earlier Tom Coughlin days, draft picks of guys that just weren't used. Just weren't used. Mm -hmm. Philip Dillard, you know, these guys none of us remember or care about. Clint Sintum, do you remember that draft pick? Oh, sure. Ramses Barden. Jarrell Jernigan. Durant Ramsey's Barton was one of those, you know, week three preseason guys. Like, oh, look at this big receiver. And then who was that big receiver we had in preseason? Pretty much. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, you know, Tom Coughlin couldn't get what he needed from Jerry Reese. Um, ben McAdoo at that point was already inheriting a broken roster. I don't even like he was just a bad coach, but didn't really feel like he was lockstep with anybody, Ben mm-hmm. McAdoo. Pat Shermer certainly wasn't lockstep with Dave Gettleman. I don't think Joe Judge was lockstep with Dave Gettleman. It almost felt like Joe Judge was starting to gain more support in the building than Dave Gettleman had. Mm -hmm. Um, This feels like a partnership and a team that is like-minded and is also able to get the most from what they already have. And that is at least refreshing. I don't know if it's necessarily impressive. Yeah, to me, I think that he instilled a confidence in his team that early on in the season, a lot of aggressive play calling moves, like going for it on fourth down, you know, going for the win and stuff that created a mindset in this team that I think you're seeing to this point now. Why is this team successful? Because they think they're good and they think they're going to win now. And I think that's on coaching, the decisions that were made early on. And you know, a lot of coaches, when they come in, they make an honest – coaches, there's not that many stupid coaches, and they're not that many that are tone deaf to the talent that they have. Jeff Saturday? <laughs> Who I saw as the first coach ever of the NFL who's never coached – been a head coach in the NFL or college. Yeah. Pretty amazing. <laughs> somebody, somebody dug up the tweet where he said the Raiders suck or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This shit's too funny, man. Anyway, sorry. But I, that that to me, like, this guy, and it's not just confidence in a way to be, like, a riverboat gambler or just being a, a an asshole about it. Like, using analytics and using making smart decisions that he thinks he's going to win and not worrying about the talent that may not be on this team. And I think creating that mindset that they're going to win has, you know, in the fourth quarter, help this team win. I think it's helped DJ. I, sure. legit, I You know, for all his jolliness that we see in Brian Dable's, you know, big bald face and his rosy cheeks and shit mm-hmm. and uh, his smart-ass answers, he's, he's a goofy, wise-ass guy, but I think he's a fucking killer. 
you know, really, honestly, I think he's a calculated and precise game planner that is going for the throw at all times. Like you said, making those ballsy moves, the confident moves. And I think that kind of thing has rubbed off on DJ. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think by extension, the rest of the team. So, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. Um, so, I guess now that the season has, you know, we're about halfway through, thinking about the decisions, that, you know, the front office and the coaching staff have made, what do you think has been the one decision you wish there could have been a do-over for in either roster construction for this year, uh, a coaching call that was made? What, if you could do one thing over again, what would it be? Man, I just – I don't know about this one. <laughs> I'm not really sure that there's – I would – I would have hoped that earlier on they weren't so gung ho about not playing the wide receivers they had. I can't, but you know, and, and this is this is a, me commenting on something I don't really know anything about. I don't know why Darius Slayton wasn't playing, but I can't think of a good fucking reason. I can't, and we're seeing now that he's kind of the best option they've got besides Wandale, uh, but they're completely different kinds of wide receivers. Yeah. So. Well, not only him. I mean, how many snaps did uh, what's his name have in week one? Galladay or Tony? Uh, well, Galladay Both. first. I, yeah. I, uh, well, I, you know what? Exactly. But just in general, you know, it's unfortunate that they had the the roster construction that they did, and there's nothing they could do about guys that were drafted last year that maybe they didn't like, or or contracts that they can't cut or trade away. But if you're stuck with somebody, I would have hope that they could make it. I don't think Kenny Galladay is a bad receiver. There can't not be a role for him on this team. Even if he is the third fucking option in this offense, he can't be not an option. Yeah. He's too expensive to not be an option. And I don't, I don't expect guys to, to be played because they get paid. You know what I mean? Like they have to earn it, whatever. But like, I also don't think Kenny Galladay is a lazy ass. I don't think that. So I, I don't know. I don't even know if this counts, but it's the only thing I can think of. I just wish they had really played the wide receivers that they had earlier on. I mean, I was thinking about it was, you know, why they get rid of Logan Ryan or Blake Martinez, especially Blake Martinez when they did. Like, what would the net positive be for having them on this defense right now? But to me, you know, I know it's still, still a fresh wound, but... I don't think I would have traded Kadarius Tony. I, I I really don't. I think that you're trying to improve the position. You know, you're trying. You know, you're not trying to pay over market value. And it's going to lead to my next question in a second about the trade. But you have a guy who's potentially, if he's not healthy this week, would be healthy at some point before we get into the real stretch run. It could be instantly be your most talented wide receiver. I wish they just would have said, "We're just going to hold on to him." And, you know, if he doesn't play the rest of this year, you make the trade in the offseason or you just get rid of him. But for this year specifically, I'd still like to have him on this roster. Um, and I guess that leads – I mean, so would I. I just um, – I, I do get it though. I get it. I get it. I get it. You know, you can't piss again into the wind and, you know, there was a hurricane in our faces with him. So, um, But it's kind of a follow-up question, you know, based on the other trades – we saw for wide receiver around the league around the trading deadline. Are you glad the Giants stayed put or you didn't pay market price to get one of those other receivers? I'm glad they stayed put. Um, you know, we, we had a whole conversation with that. I had a whole write up that I did one night cause I was just inspired. Um, but I had only ever said that there were options worth exploring because it felt like the fan base was very hard. Yes. We need to trade or hard. No, we need to rebuild. And I felt like, there is a middle ground there. There are guys that can be part of the future that we can trade for right now and help this year. There were a few. Their asking price was too high. Um, the Texans were reportedly looking for Cooks a second round pick. That's stupid. That would have been dumb to trade away. And I'm glad that they didn't. Um, you know, it's the same as what the Bears gave up for Chase Claypool. You know, the Calvin Ridley Hall, you know, a 2023 fifth or sixth or whatever, and a 2024 third or fourth or whatever that is, that one almost makes sense from like a standpoint of, you know, the player you get and what you give away. But Calvin Ridley's not going to play this year. So it doesn't make any sense 
for them to trade for a guy that right. will not play this year. You might as well just address it in the off season. Don't right. give away future assets for that. So I'm fine. They, you know, they they it appears they did their due diligence. There was a guy or two that they really liked. They inquired about asking prices too high. Go fuck yourself. That's fine. Yep, I 100% agree completely. Um, based on the first eight games, what do you think are the now? We and we do this is this is something that goes back before we even started the pod the podcast. It was like three biggest needs, you know, the draft is coming up. So based on the, the first half of the season, what you've seen going to this off season, what are the three biggest needs of this team? Well, the number one has to be quarterback. Tyro Taylor is the only quarterback signed to this team next year. Mm-hmm. That is number one. It's the most important position in sports. I think you can uh, wide receivers, probably second um, because they have none. It's a need that is not addressed with one move. <laughs> they need several. Mm-hmm. They need a lot. Uh, and I think corner. You know, it's it's awesome what they've been able to get at a Fabian Moreau. Maybe that's something they can seek in the long term. I do believe Aaron Robinson is good if you put him in the slot where he belongs, where he can play a little bit more downhill. He can play a little bit more with his hands. He's not exposed as much. He's got help on the inside. Uh, same thing with Darnay Holmes. I think it's fine on the inside. But Dory Jackson's not going to be here much longer anyway. And Fabian Moreau is not really a long-term solution. So corner, to me, has to be number three. And we can talk about inside linebacker. We can talk about some offensive line spots or whatever the hell we want. Tight end, probably. We don't have any tight ends. But all those things, I think you can get relatively cheap replacements at inside linebacker. You can get by with a, an aging veteran for, for cheap or you know a later draft pick or some shit like that. Same thing with tight end. Um I'm worried about corner. I'm worried about wide receiver. Yeah. I'm definitely worried about quarterback. I have no idea who's going to be under center next year. Crystal Ball, is he the quarterback in week one next year, Daniel Jones? Well, I mean, who's going to bid them? That's a thing I always talk about with people. It's kind of like... Who wants it's, him? It's, it's, all, it's not all or nothing with Daniel Jones. It's not like, well, if we didn't franchise him, all of a sudden someone's going to offer him $35 million next year. Well, I mean, that's and not really the, forget the year. price, forget the price, but just who are they going to have to bid against? Is there going to be a lot of teams that are they're going to have to bid against or a few? I mean, like Washington comes to mind, Indianapolis maybe, Carolina. Carolina definitely. Uh is Vegas in question? New England? New England? Mm, I don't know about maybe. New England. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, both those guys suck. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> is Houston a question? Could be. I mean, there there's to me, there's enough suitors out there. There's not enough solutions. I don't really like this draft for a quarterback anymore. Um, crystal ball today, November 7th. Daniel Jones is the quarterback of the Giants next year. But I don't feel – it's a bit foggy of a ball. You know what I'm saying? I think I think crystal ball, I think he's back. And I think we're still having this conversation. Will he be back next year? And will it be a – you know, I, I – it's almost like you have to make you go have to roll the dice a little bit with him because you'd have to assume that this offense is going to get better around him. You know, he, next year he'll have more weapons. Next year, you hope the offensive line will be better, so he might be showing out more, and his price might be going up to keep him. So it's almost like do you want to do something, you know, stopgap for one more year and test, or or do you want to pay even more the year after? I think they have to make a decision on that. If they're in, I think they need to be in. Um, I agree with you. I agree with that entirely. And I do think that his price is going to go up. I I, um, I wonder if they're going to strike any deals with anybody that they want to keep long-term before the season ends. Interesting thought, right? Mm-hmm. I Just to, to button up what we said before, I think that uh, guard is something they still need to address. I mean, that's, uh, mm-hmm. you know... There's, I would say, center more than guard, but regardless, that interior O line spot. You know, John Feliciano is only signed for this year. Nick Gates is only signed for this year, and he's, I mean, a tenuous solution. You yeah, get I mean, to play, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy he's back, but people are just like, well, start him here and start him here. It's like, well, it, it's not even. Can the I see point. he's on the field, please, before we get you know, pencil him in for anything. The next eight games are all Nick Gates has here right yeah. now. So, yeah. I mean, that's still not a solution. I don't know who's no. snapping the ball. It might be Shane Lemieux who practiced it when he was drafted, and that was the last I heard of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I w- me, I'm leaning center, but interior O-line, I, I, I think, you know, it's all the same shit. 
Who's the MVP of this team? This one's easy. Hands down. It's Andrew Thomas. Yep. It is indisputable that he is playing at an all-pro pro level this year. I don't give a shit. This offense means nothing without a good O-line. And we, we know that because we've been watching it for years. Um, <laughs> True. And, and Thomas is the real deal. And I'm not just saying that because he's the guy I wanted it for and had to vehemently state my claim as several important people in the media told me that he was the worst of the four guys. <laughs> we will always be taking this for granted going forward with Andrew Thomas. I just want you to know. Fan base, you know, the same as the Browns felt with Joe Thomas, the same as the Cowboys felt with Tyron Smith, the same as the Eagles probably felt with Jason Peters. They're just going to take it you're just going to take it for granted. He's too good. He's yep. locked down. He's given up almost nothing this year, which is insane because we haven't not faced good pass rushers. Mm -hmm. That's just not true. Um I, I would I would hope that he stays healthy for the rest of the year and I would hope that they have found their left tackle for the next like decade because man it would feel good right and you back up the Brinks truck and you pay him when it's time to pay him too I think you can start thinking about paying him now sure absolutely last question crystal ball again What's this team doing the rest of the year? How far are they going? All right. Well, I'm not going to be Debbie down here, but uh, I am a grump. So <laughs> I think this team makes the playoffs. Um, but I think it's a little bit closer than Giants fans think right now. Dallas didn't really lose a lot without their starting quarterback. They really didn't. So we made no separation whatsoever and didn't beat them. Philly still hasn't lost. It's Fading, already we, it, we lost ground to Dallas last week before the bye. Yeah, game, absolutely. Yeah. Um it's an uphill sled to begin with, but I do think that the NFC is bad enough and the Giants have an easy enough schedule that they can win enough games to make it. I do think in the second half I think they're going to win a game that people don't expect, maybe Philly, maybe Dallas, not sure. But I also think they're going to lose a game that people don't expect. I'm looking at Washington. Oh, not sure which just... game but, I, was, uh, I was thinking one of the next two games we have these two. Uh, I could see them losing to the Lions too. Yeah, one of those. One of those two. I mean, just this league is just so wonky. I mm -hmm. mean, there was a stretch yesterday where Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, and another quarterback hadn't thrown a touchdown. It was like they hadn't, the teams hadn't scored touchdowns with those quarterbacks. Well, there's something else I saw too. What was it like? The Raiders hadn't passed the fifty-yard line in something like seven quarters or some shit like that. Yeah, it's it's craziness. Insane. But um, that craziness is. I mean, it can go with the Giants way. a chance. Sure, I, I, and I do think that with the starters on this roster, with this coaching staff, I think they can make noise in the playoffs. But if I had to predict, though, I think injuries to starters are going to end up forcing depth players to play in positions they can't hold up against playoff teams. Um, and that's going to make winning in the playoffs really tough. And so I, maybe they'll win one game in the playoffs is what I predict. Here's the other thing too is, you know, we've been saying, we've been thinking the special sauce for this team this year has been coaching. And, you know, just the great job schematically, play calling, going for it, blah, blah, blah. We are playing, if you look at the teams that are ahead of us in the NFC that we have to face in the playoffs, we have to face Philly twice. We're playing at Minnesota. Um, these are teams that we'd probably get to face, you know, a second time if we get into the playoffs. And they will have film on us, film when they played them. You know, it's that's why division games are always so tough because you're familiar with the team. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad team. We're playing these teams once already because. If our competitive advantage of our coaching teams kind of goes away because they have more film on us, you know, personal film on us and personal, you know, experience with us, I don't know if that helps us out or not in the playoffs. I think these next two games are our future for this season. If we we go two and zero in these next two, we're in the playoffs. If we split or even you know lose these next two games or even split. I'm going to be worried because those two are the buffer games for me for getting in. And I could see them losing to Detroit. Sure. I could see anybody in this league 
on any week losing to anybody. I mean, that Philly Houston game. Did you watch any of that Thursday night? Yes. How did how did Houston look? A lot better than I thought. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, they're they playing the best team in the league at the it's time. It's also so. a Thursday game. That's true, but they also have a couple extra days to heal up and prepare for us too. Very true. We have a we have a bye, but they also have ten days. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not I'm not picking Houston to beat us, but you know, I don't know if we are good enough at this point just to assume we're winning these two games and then worry about the December division games and the Minnesota game and all that. So. These next two games are very telling for me. We win these two, we're in the playoffs. The question is going to be, you know, how far do we go? I, you know, if we can, if we can somehow get to that one wild card spot, and we have to play, you know, the winner of the NFC South. <laughs> you can. Who tell is that, that even? Is that is that going to be Tampa? At, at, at this moment, it's Tampa. But to any of those it's not out of the realm of possibility that it could be Carolina, too. Sure. Only two games back. Yeah. So, I mean, it may all come down to, you know, that Thanksgiving game is ginormous against Dallas. Ugh, and I hate that we're playing that. I hate that we're—I I don't know how you feel, but I detest the idea of having to watch that game in a family setting because it makes me not a fun family member. For starters, yeah. I did. Family te- knows the, the family knows what I'm all about. So, yeah, me too. Also- that ain't gonna make me less mad when they're asking me stupid fucking questions while it's going on. Yes, um, yep. I'll be with some. Our family's so big that we don't spend Thanksgiving together. In case anybody's asking, we don't, <laughs> yeah. we don't have a family feud or anything. We just have a, a ginormous family. But the people I'm hoping to be at Thanksgiving with, they're a bunch of me's. There's no silly questions to be asked. <laughs> I mean, it, I, yeah, either way, sometimes when shit's going wrong, I just kind of need to be alone to deal with it. I don't know if – I guess you're not the same way with I'm that. getting better. I'm definitely getting better. Like, I wouldn't say I'm a bad hang at a game when we're losing. I've definitely – No, had- well, I mean, I think I think it's been a sobering couple of years for us, huh? Of course. I mean, <laughs> and, it, and again, that's not just the Giants. The Gators have done that to me. The Knicks have done that to me. You know, everybody's done that to me. So, um, but, it, but the point is – I just hate that game. I fucking hate that game. I hate that there's three Thanksgiving games, too. Why why so many? I like wall-to-wall football. I do, too. I just I feel like the first game starts a little too early, and the last game goes on too late. Is anyone watching the end of the last game? Or is most people... Most people are asleep. If it's good. I guess. I mean, it's it's the same as any Thursday night game. If it's not good, I'm gonna fall asleep. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. It's just I I assume people are online shopping and shit. I don't know. (laughs) It doesn't matter. I just I hate playing on Thanksgiving. I hate the I hate the national spectacle of it. I hate the fact that it's a Thursday. I hate that it's the Cowboys. Because I hate that it's a division game for us. Like it's one thing that the Cowboys play the Browns or whatever on Thanksgiving, right? But that means so much more to us than it does an AFC team. Yeah, but they have the same disadvantage we do. They have short rest and no, uh, they don't because they don't play them twice a year, no, and they don't they don't have they don't have the the about. implications. I mean, for the, oh, for you the, mean the Cowboys and us? Yeah, I mean, they yeah, both have but, a short week. Yeah, I just I don't know. I just hate the Thanksgiving game. It pisses me off. <laughs> I I don't mind watching football. In fact, I love watching football on Thanksgiving. I just don't want it to be my team. I want to relax. <laughs> I guess so. I mean, it's tough to relax too. When you look at Washington um, showing up, I, what are they four and five now? Giants are in third place all of a sudden at six and two. It's kind of tightening up even more. Yeah. Well, the good thing is Dallas has not exactly been stellar on Thanksgivings over the last fifteen years either. So no, they're terrible on Thanksgiving the last. Yeah. 15 so maybe years. that might be something that's. An advantage. Yeah, but those are one of those stats that I'm like, what does that even mean? What what is what does a Dallas team from six years ago on Thanksgiving have anything to do with this one? Other than the logo. Yeah. True. I don't know. So that's gonna do it for this portion of this show. Uh where you know, it's it's an interesting look at this team because honestly, it's just weird to be six and two, super relevant, and also <laughs> rebuilding. This was never really not to say it wasn't intended. Your intention is always to win, but 
certainly wasn't expected. This is just sort of collateral Your damage. Your to try to win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're going to keep trying to win. And on Sunday, they will be hosting the Houston Texans, I think, at 1 o'clock at MetLife. Yeah. Um, Doubleheader weekend for me, so 6 a.m. flight. We'll be there at 1. Yeah, we will be there at 1. Oh, God, 6 a.m. flight. What time you land? At 9? 8.30? Uh, I think I get into Newark at 10. Hopefully, Ooh. the grump will pick me up and take us directly to the middle. I mean, I can do that. That's not a problem. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. It just sucks for you. It's That's a... Uh, so I don't need sleep after... After it's not about this. It's just Carolina on Saturday. I could sleep on the on the plane. You you go from a cramped seat to a cramped seat. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. So the, there is an upcoming game on Sunday, which means on Thursday night we'll be recording our Friday morning show, which is a preview show against the Houston Texans, where we're going to break down injuries, keys to the game, news, um. And matchups to watch and stuff like that. Yeah. So be sure to follow us on Twitter at football underscore grump at the cranky fan at just giants pod. Be sure to like and subscribe this show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Play, etc. Um, as well as YouTube as well, the channel that we are trying to grow. We have a bunch of off season draft stuff that we are building for a bigger YouTube experience coming up. Yeah. Uh, so be, be sure, sure to tell- do all that stuff. Tell your yeah, friends too. I, you guys have been following us for f- like five years, four years. You got friends? Tell them. Yeah, and, and a shout out also to Bobby and Justin from uh, Talking Giants for the uh, for the good word for us to help us spread our audience. We we always appreciate and we love those guys. So hats off to to you. So uh, I think Bobby's coming up for the Washington game. We'll have a nice fun tailgate for that for sure. Yes, definitely. Um. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. So we will see you all Friday morning. Until then, go Giants. Go Giants.